started, everybody. Um, and I think a few people will come in, but that's all right. So my name is Sandra Wilson, and um, I'm the editor of the Education Coordinating Group with Campbell Collaboration, among other things. And my topic today is coding. And um, I've always called it coding. A lot of people call it data extraction. And so these are, this is the same thing that, um, for those of you who are data extraction people, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so the overview of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to cover a couple of different levels of study coding. So um, screening for eligibility is something I think of as part of the coding process. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And within that eligibility screening world, there's title and abstract screening and full text screening, so we can talk about that a little bit. Then I'll talk about study content coding, so coding the substantive characteristics of the studies themselves, their methods, their people, their interventions, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Effect size coding is a whole other animal, and there's a workshop just on that tomorrow at 10.30, so I'm not going to talk about effect sizes, um, although we can if there are questions about that. And then I'll talk about some common mistakes people make. Mostly I know about these things because I've made them, so I have firsthand mistake experience. Okay, so what's the point of study coding? Why do we do this? in the context of doing a systematic review. Well, I mean, the, the big point is that we need to provide an accounting of the research included in our systematic reviews. What does this research look like? What do the studies look like in this body of literature? What are their characteristics? What do their people look like? Um, it also helps tell us what's missing in the literature. If you're interested in a particular intervention, and um, you code all this information, you're now going to know what wasn't there that you were interested in finding. Um, so this basically is about identifying the characteristics of the intervention, subjects, and methods in the research that you're reviewing. But I think the more interesting part of this is assuming that different primary studies on the same topic produce different results, because by and large they do. Study coding allows us to identify the variables that might explain why those studies come out differently, because not every study has exactly the same effect size, and I'd like to know why that's so. And that's what study coding is really about for me. So, so in the describing your literature part of study coding and why you do it. There are a couple ways to, I'm going to show you some examples of this before I go into the nuts and bolts. So this is one kind of example of how you might describe your literature. So this is a systematic review that has 20 studies in it. And I've coded the publication year, I've coded the method of assignment to the intervention and comparison groups, I've coded how long the interventions are, and I've coded the age of the participants in the interventions. And so I'm just telling the world, this is what these 20 studies look like. You know, most of them are fairly recent, uh, most of them are non-random assignment designs, my kids are about age 12. You know, so this is kind of, when you're doing a systematic review, sort of the first thing you want to say about the studies in your review. And a lot of times, people can do something like this in the body of their review, and then they might do something like this in an appendix, or in a smaller review, you could do this in the body of the review. And here, I've kind of broken down similar information for each study that I've coded. So I'm kind of accounting for each study and what the intervention is, who the treatment personnel were, what the design was, outcomes, and what the subjects look like. So this is sort of a different way of thinking about describing the study characteristics. One is sort of summarizing all of them. This one, we do it individually. 
So this is the study characteristics as moderators thing. This is the second reason we do coding, is to help us explain why our effect sizes are different. And um, if any of you were in the moderator session earlier, these are just two examples of how you might do this. But basically I have a mean effect size from my 20 studies, say. Well, in the meta-regression model, let's say I have 100 studies. Um, and I'm trying to predict why those, what the variability around that mean is associated with, whether it's associated with the method of assignment, <coughs> whether it's associated with how many males are in the sample, whether it's associated with the implementation quality. So all these things that I've coded become the things that predict variability in my outcomes. <coughs> and then the ANOVA model is basically breaking down all the studies' mean effect sizes by what their design was <coughs> to see if they were different from each other. So those are kind of the outcomes of the coding process. Okay, so now how do you do all this? Or what, what should you include in your coding scheme? Um, the first part of coding for me is, is coding or screening for eligibility. And so what comes with that is designing eligibility criteria. And for anybody, I mean, there are lots of different kinds of meta-analyses and systematic reviews. Most of us here, I think, are intervention reviewers. And so the PICOS framework is the most common and I think makes the most sense. And um, the way you think about eligibility criteria is what studies am I going to include in my review? And I frame that around five things. Who the participants are that I'm going to include or not. What the interventions are that I'm going to include or not. What those interventions are compared to. What the comparison groups look like. What the outcomes are. And the study designs that are eligible. And sometimes it's easier to start with the I, the interventions, and I don't know why they didn't come up with a more clever acronym with I first, because that's how I think about it. But um, <laughs> maybe there is one. Um, but anyways, if you start from thinking about your interventions and what the characteristics are of the interventions that you're going to include in your review, then from there you can kind of break it down into, okay, am I interested in all participants who might be in these interventions, or am I only interested in a particular age group, or, or participants in a particular setting? You know, is it only school-based settings? Um, the comparison groups, you know, do I have only comparison groups that get nothing? Or do I have treatment as usual comparison groups or placebos? Or, you know, what are the kind of levels of that counterfactual that you're interested in? Um, in some treatment literatures, the comparison groups or the counterfactuals get treatment too. I mean, because if you think about substance abuse <coughs> treatment, um, it's very unlikely that a control group is not going to get any services at all. So you might have some requirements for what kinds of services that control group gets to help make your studies similar that you're going to be reviewing. Um, outcomes. Um, it's, it's really could be anything that you're thinking of that fits with your intervention. Usually there's going to be a couple of outcomes that are important to you that are maybe the targets of the intervention. There might be secondary outcomes that are things like that are part of the causal chain of the intervention, so sort of intermediate outcomes that you would expect to change before the big outcome changes. Um, and then also kind of outcomes that would indicate that the intervention might be harmful. So what are the possible adverse effects of this intervention that you might also include in your coding and in your eligibility criteria? And then study designs. There could be, you could be interested in RCTs, quasi-experiments. It really is a range of different things depending on the purposes of your study. And the idea here when you design these eligibility criteria is to write out something that 
anybody could use. If I had this form that said, I am interested in these kinds of studies that have these kinds of characteristics based on this framework, could other people then take a journal article and decide whether it's in or out? So you have to be really specific about what are the boundaries of the intervention. You can't just say, I'm interested in cognitive behavioral therapy. You have to say what that looks like. Is it group cognitive behavioral therapy? Do they have to have modeling? Do they, you know, so you get very specific about what this thing is that makes a study in or out. When you're talking about study designs, you know, you can't just say RCTs. Because what about cluster randomized trials? Is that in? Is that out? What about quasi experiments? Do they have to have matching? Do they need to have group equivalents or covariates? You know, so get specific about these criteria because that's going to be most defensible and that's going to be the easiest to implement. You can also have geographic area, time language, and other criteria as well. Okay. So when you start doing a systematic review, you've done your literature search, you have this pile of, you know, 3,000 abstracts that came out of your literature search, and you need to winnow that down a little bit. And your first thought really is, can I apply those eligibility criteria I just wrote to the abstracts of these studies? And really, no, you can't. Because an abstract is not going to give you all the information you need. So usually there's two levels of, of eligibility screening. One where you kind of get rid of the irrelevant stuff that came up in your search. And then secondly, you're going to do a more thorough review. And usually um, you're going to look at whether this study might be relevant. So you can exclude studies with animals in them if your topic is about um, violence prevention intervention, say. Um, or it's clear that the study is just describing a program and not evaluating the program. So you're kind of making real surface decisions at the abstract level. It's really um, difficult to get a good handle on the research design from an abstract. And um, so I encourage you not to exclude things based on research design at the abstract level. Um, typically, the title and the abstract don't give you reliable information about design, outcomes, subject characteristics. They may say children, and you're interested in a particular age group. Um, and if you have the resources Double screening at the abstract stage is a good idea. Um, it's If you have a huge hit rate in your search and have tens of thousands, you might do random samples to get people reliable. Um, I skipped over something there, didn't I? Okay, here's an abstract screening example that we've used recently in a project I've been doing. Um, so we got all the abstracts and loaded them into a database and then have some pretty easy questions that you can say yes, no, or can't tell. Is this a study? Are the students in post-secondary education? Is it quantitative? Does it report on the effects of an intervention and does it involve remediation? So these are things that we think we can tell pretty reliably from the abstract. And, um, and the, um, we were interested in also knowing why we excluded each abstract. So that's why we recorded the yeses and nos. And any study that has a can't tell all the way down or yeses all the way down gets retrieved in its full text form. But once you come up upon a reason that says, no, this is a qualitative study, boom, it's out, we don't retrieve it. That's just an example of one thing. What's yes? Oh, what software did you, did you use? Ah, this is FileMaker. 
Um, and we develop our own coding and screening instruments in FileMaker. Um, I, I don't know if this is a good, I should probably find out about this, if some of the other um, software packages like CMA um, or RevMan can do something like this. This is really handy because we have the abstracts right there. And then we have it pre-programmed. I took some of the things off. We have little text boxes where we can, the coders can write in words that they want highlighted. So this coder said, I want every time I see the word remedial, it to show up in red. And that you can change that from coder to coder. And, and then we export all these things and retrieve the ones that passed screening. And so then we end up with a set of full text dissertations and articles and reports. And based on those PICOS criteria and all those things, we have a very detailed screening instrument. And um, we decide which ones are in or out based on that instrument. Um, before we do that screening, one of the things we do, I mean, in the social sciences, and I think in, in other areas, but especially in the social sciences, you're likely to find more than one study report or article about exactly the same study. For example, you might do your dissertation on an intervention trial and then publish that in a journal. And I find that from my systematic review, those two things are not really two studies. They're one study. So before we do our final eligibility screening, we have to kind of find all the friends and put them together. And that's easier said than done, but it's something to really be mindful of because you really don't want to treat that one study as two just because it's published twice. And you also can find what two studies within one article? Yes. Some study reports <laughs> might have two or three or four totally independent studies, like multi-site trials. And so you have to kind of screen those separately. And we might, we do everything with study IDs. So we might have, you know, study ID 100, study A, 100, study B, you know, so we can keep track of the differences even though it might be a single article. Uh-huh. The question was, would you include the dissertation or the journal article? And I include both. It's one study. So I might find information about the effect sizes in the journal article, but I might find information about implementation quality in the dissertation. So I'm going to use all the information I have to code that study. And I would never pick one. I think that's... Um, not a good idea because you're going to find, especially when you have multiple journal articles and big projects, one might report on a certain kind of outcome and another might report another outcome that you're interested in. So you really want to combine them, if that makes sense. But yes? Is, is there an issue with, like, say, um, a working paper versus a journal article? In the working paper, there might be extra information on different outcomes, but you may not want to give as much um, credence to that since it's in the working paper and not in the peer reviewed. Ah, but see, we wouldn't want to have only peer reviewed studies in our systematic review because that might be publication bias. What about all those other studies out there um, that may tell us something different about our literature? Because there is, there is a place where we talk about study quality which we will, um, and risk of bias and that kind of thing. But no, I would not necessarily say just because there's a published article and a working paper, if they provide different information that's relevant to my coding, I want to include both. If they report the same outcomes and they happen to be different, like the means are different in the working paper and the journal article, I'm going to take the journal article version. Um, and so you would develop rules for those kinds of situations because they do come up. 
But there's, um, there are many good reasons not to leave out um, unpublished or unpeer-reviewed things. Okay, where am I? Excuse me. Uh-huh. How do you ID the friends, like the dissertation? Do you, give, do you say 100A and 100B, or? Oh, uh, no, the friends are 100. And um, and we might what there we have lots of different levels of IDing these things and so we might have for um, multiple report studies we'll have a study report combination that tells us this is report number one from this study this is report number two from the same study um, and it just, it's all linked up in various levels of databases if you're doing a really complex systematic review where you're going to have that sort of structure, let me know because we can help you set these things up. Um, yes? What about examples for like the more detailed screening forms? Do you have those? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and actually if we should put some of these on the website because I'll tell you about this when we get more into um, hold on, I should remember what time we started and what time I'm supposed to end. Um, you just back it up to 15 minutes and be 4.45. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. That's exactly what I need to know. Okay. Yes, we have some detailed screening, and I'll talk about this a little bit, because um, we do all of our coding and data extraction on computers, and so we kind of have to shorten the text a little bit. But with every coding manual or eligibility screening document we have a very detailed word document that goes along with it um, so I'll show you I think that's where we're going here yeah okay so um, this is eligibility screening this is a FileMaker database also and here we have our list of criteria and you can see it's a pretty short text thing but we have this very long description of what a school-based school affiliated or community-based dropout program is that the coders have and in fact in later versions of this we have it programmed in so they can click on that and get a little pop-up screen that says exactly what they're supposed to be thinking about um, the same with the groups are randomly assigned, matched, or provide equivalents. We have lots of detail. It's a whole page of how to identify what a random assignment design looks like. And I have examples of all these code books. So if people email me, I can send you these things. And I will also say at some point that a lot of Campbell systematic reviews include copies of their coding manuals with their protocols. And so you can go into the Campbell Library and um, look them over. Some are more detailed than, uh, than others. Um, because we do big meta-analyses in, in my research institute, we have a lot of different coders working on projects. So we have pretty detailed manuals because there's going to be multiple people doing it. Um, others, where there's maybe two coders and they know each other and they sit next to each other, there maybe is less text. Okay, so once you've done all this screening of your full text reports, you have an accounting of the ineligible studies and the reasons that they were ineligible. And Cochrane and Campbell reviews often include a table of um, excluded studies in, um, in the reviews as an appendix. And more importantly, you're also going to have a set of studies that's eligible for coding. And here's a sample exclusion table. And there are a couple different ways to do this. One, in this case, I have so many excluded studies. This is, we had thousands of excluded studies. And so listing every single one of those thousands of studies and why we excluded it was prohibitive. It's just way too long. So we summarized. Most of the studies we excluded, we excluded because they weren't school-based interventions. 
and many fewer were excluded because of the population or because of the population. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so this is one way of doing it if you have a lot of excluded studies. Here's the more traditional way. You're going to list every study you excluded and why. This is really common in smaller reviews where the search was, was, didn't have so many hits. And, you know. So it kind of depends on the size of your literature and what you're talking about. And you may end up in the text of your review do this kind of table and then have an appendix with this kind of table. Sort of depends on um, who your editor is and what your interests are. Okay, so now we get to the study coding eventually. And um, obviously you guys know you can interrupt me while I'm talking and so you should continue to do that. Um, so um, a coding manual or code book is really the, the most important part here. I'm hearing beeping, and I'm hoping that's not me beeping. Um, so your coding manual is going to include um, items in several different classes. This is going to be information about the setting, the study context, the authors, the publication date, publication type. And I, what I'm going to do here, this is the kind of everything but the kitchen sink method. So I'm going to tell you all the possible things that you might want to code. And it's your job as a systematic reviewer to narrow that down into something that's manageable and, and works for the literature that you're reviewing. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. But you really can't code all of this stuff. And so you have to pick the important things. And we'll talk about how to do that. Um, so you have these kind of general contextual things. You're going to have information about methods and method quality or risk of bias. You're going to have information about your programs, about the participants in those programs, the outcomes, and the findings of the studies, the effect sizes. And like I said, you're going to have a, a detailed paper version of this thing. And if you want to code on the computer, which you should do, because it really makes things easier, um, you'll have an electronic version also. And you can do this in Excel if you want. Um, you can make your own databases. I know RevMan and CMA have modules that allow you to kind of put your coding data extraction items in. So there's, there's lots of ways to, to get this in the computer. OK, so sources for coding items because you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. Um, Campbell Reviews have coding manuals as appendices, like I said. And these can be really useful for generic kinds of items, like things for, about research design or risk of bias that are going to apply broadly across any number of, of intervention areas. And then the literature that you're reviewing is I think the most important source of information about what to code. Um, if you start from the assumption that you're going to find variability in your treatment effects, what does the literature tell you about the plausible sources of that variability? I mean, the primary studies are going to talk about what they think is important about their intervention. They're going to talk about, you know, my intervention. Um, is going to work because I have this kind of, it is me that's beeping, isn't it? Um, and I don't really know how to solve that. Is there a red box with a time on it? Um, a red box with a time Sometimes on it. Sometimes it does that when it's going to shut off, but it shouldn't. Should there it is a... No, and I don't want to push this button that says on off that is red. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to keep on going, and we'll hope that it doesn't, like, totally annoy us. Okay. Um, so I think the literature can be really helpful in thinking about what the, the important elements are that you would want to code about your interventions and the settings and the participants in them. 
you know, the theory of change for this intervention that you're interested in is going to tell you a lot about what aspects of the interventions that you want to code. <laughs> um, and a lot of times if you think about when you're reading primary studies, the authors are going to say, well, we're, we're interested in this cognitive behavioral therapy intervention. And we wanted to try a variation on the model done by, you know, Wilson and Smith because their study didn't show good effects and we think their study didn't show good effects because it wasn't long enough. So we're going to have a longer intervention. And so that right there tells me that maybe dosage might matter. And so I want to code that. So I think it's it, really think about this literature and what other people doing work in this area think is important to code. So I've, I've regularly used this. I think um, traditional Cochrane style reviewers would say you're not supposed to look at the literature before you review it. And really, I don't think in the social sciences we can really think about what's important about interventions without studying them before we start doing this. So, uh, okay, study context. So again, this is going to be the kitchen sink method, and you guys have to pick and choose what you think is important. So I'm going to tell you a lot of options and then you kind of narrow it down to your particular setting. Um, so again, this whole idea of studies versus reports and multiple publications, um, it's important to know about that. Um, setting, language, publication type, this has implications for publication bias, so recording that is is always a good idea and it's an easy coding item. Is this a dissertation? Is it a journal article? Uh, publication date versus study date. Um, I think in some of the international literatures where they have these huge, uh, like the international development literature where they have these huge large scale studies where the intervention may have happened in 1990 and they have reports coming out 10, 12 years later, recording that information might be worth thinking about. Um, sometimes I, I in uh, intervention studies in school-based settings or even in criminal justice settings, um, whether something is a really highly controlled research project done by researchers and, you know, they go out and recruit all these people and assign them and it's this very highly controlled situation versus demonstration projects or programs that are already out going on in the community and then people do an evaluation of them. I think that's an interesting thing to think about coding. So that's another context variable. Um, here's an example of a coding item. And you know, it's just type of publication. Here are all the choices. And then we might have in our coding manual suggestions about how to code this when you have more than one type of publication for a study, for example. Which one do you choose? So you kind of think about when you write these things up, you may not realize. You say, okay, we're going to code type of publication. But then when you have three publications for the same study and they're different, then what do you do? So you have to have little decision rules. And sometimes those decision rules, rules don't occur to you at first and it's okay to go back and add them and then make sure if you've already coded three studies that you go back and look at those again too but really I think this a lot of times when you're starting off you don't really see all the possibilities and uh, so it's it's dinging but maybe if you do you know what it is already okay so I'll keep talking and you listen <laughs> See, this is going to be like some weird, crazy YouTube thing now that we're talking about this, and it's going to be all, you know, I'm going to go viral. Um, so, okay. Um, so that's a publication type coding item. Um, study method coding or risk of bias coding. Now, there's a, a session on Thursday about this. Um, it's not a workshop. I think they're doing some panel presentations, but if you're interested in in risk of bias, 
that's just an advertisement. Um, so coding study methods. I think this is one of the hardest parts of doing a systematic review. And I think it's one of the, did you hear that? <laughs> um, it, it's, it's one of the hardest parts of coding, but I think it's one of the most important parts of coding because I think study method makes a difference in the outcomes of your studies. There's a large amount of research out there that effect sizes from RCTs look different from effect sizes from QEDs. And the scary part about that is they don't always look bigger or smaller. It varies from literature to literature. And so that really tells us that it makes a difference. We're not quite sure how or when, but we really need to be aware of it. And there's a variety of options for thinking about how to code the methods of the study. One of them is the risk of bias tool. And with that is the grade framework is sort of a way to summarize those results at the end of your review. Is that it? Uh-huh. <laughs> Do you know what it is? No, I've actually never uh, heard that before. Just you mind if I No. Nope. Okay. I guess we can turn the sound off, right? I'm gonna say if Yeah. Okay, done. <laughs> why why did I not think of that? Awesome, thank you. It's either that or it's, uh, Oh. I think it was that. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> and I guess I could do mute, right? Oh, no, no. It no? Was okay. Warning you that it was going to shut down. Okay. Oh. All right. So, excuse me. So there's Cochrane Risk of Bias Framework for coding method quality, and then there's lots of instructions about how to do that in the Cochrane manual. Um, there are method quality checklists, which I will say and then never talk about again, because um, they're really, um, well, I'll tell you why, I think, in a minute. And then the final way to think about it is what I call direct coding, and we'll talk about each of these things a little bit. So the risk of bias framework kind of comes at the idea of study methods by thinking about potential sources of bias in your study effects. And as you all know from your research design course in graduate school, there are lots of different sources of bias, selection bias, performance bias, attrition bias, all of these things can influence the size of your effect size, sometimes in weird and strange and unknowable ways. And, um, and so the risk of bias instrument kind of walks you through for each study, thinking about systematic differences between groups at the baseline, so sources of selection bias. Um, performance bias, like contamination, attrition, detection bias, like whether the data collectors um, kind of see things differently because they know what group they're observing, um, and then reporting bias. Um, and, they, and there's lots of different, what's the word? There's lots of different ways that these kinds of biases can manifest in studies. And it's important to kind of think about what selection bias is or what performance bias is when you're thinking about this. And the, the Cochrane Handbook has a lot of language about how to think about this, but really, I mean, the way I, I'm, when I'm talking about selection bias, uh, I'm thinking about the ways my groups at the baseline of my study might have been somehow different from each other, even in an RCT. And they might be different because randomization failed, or they might be different because I have some dodgy quasi-experiment where I didn't really think about where my control group came from. Um, there's lots of different things to think about here. And so what this tool does is it allows you to rate the different kinds of biases that might be present in a study and then later you can look at whether that made a difference in the outcomes. 
And the way they code it in this particular instrument is it might be low risk of bias. So it was a really well done RCT and there was no indication that um, the um, allocation was obvious to the people or that it <coughs> affected their choices in some way. Um, or, you know, you had low attrition, so there's low risk of bias because of attrition. Um, or the reporting bias is a big one. Let's say the study authors measured 15 outcomes, but they only report the significant ones. And if they tell you that, that's pretty high reporting bias there. Sometimes you're not going to know the answer to that one. And I think that reporting bias is probably the biggest one that we don't know about because they don't tell you. Okay, so there are modifications to the Cochrane framework. Some of these are more formal than others. But, the, and Cochrane is actually coming up with some of these modifications as they expand into quasi-experimental studies. Um, the idea here is that some of the ways we think about selection bias with randomized studies are, or some of the other sources of bias with randomized studies don't make so much sense both with quasi-experiments and with social science research. So it's hard to think about blinding of your study participants, for example, um, when you're doing educational interventions. The teachers know what condition they're in because they're learning a new curriculum. Um, or the kids know, or the parents know, because you, no, you can't give them a fake thing. So, so blinding is difficult to think about, and so maybe when you're coding studies like this, it's really about performance bias, not blinding. And so was there contamination? Um, were there refusals to participate because they got assigned to the condition that they didn't want to participate in? So you sort of think about what the point of blinding is, which is that st people don't know what condition they're in, and think about other ways to, to get at that same idea. Um, what else? And with um, quasi-experimental studies, I think selection bias is the big issue, is whether the groups are equivalent at the beginning of your study. And um, so that may need some additional coding. It's not just a quasi-experimental study. It's a quasi-experimental study and they did propensity score matching. So that may be better than just some, um, oh, we picked the school next door. You know, so thinking about coding those kinds of sources of bias, not just saying it was an RCT or a QED, okay? Method quality checklists, I, I am gonna say something about them. Um, there are lots of these available out there. Um, most of them have pretty questionable reliability and validity. And a lot of them kind of add up all these things that we've been talking about into one number. And so they conflate all these different problems with each other. And, um, and it's really a difficult way to think about evaluating study quality. So it's not recommended. And um, weighting your, your effect sizes by some quality score is not good. Don't do it. Okay. So this other way, which I've sort of been getting at when I'm talking about the risk of bias, is the idea of actually just coding what the methods are rather than evaluating whether there's low risk or medium risk or high risk. It's, I want to directly code how people were assigned. Were they assigned individually or by group? <coughs> And then they, were they assigned by a random method or were they assigned by, you know, every other person or did they do matching or did they do some other method? So I'm going to actually code that. Instead of saying there's high risk of selection bias, I'm going to say these are the different ways that assignment <coughs> happened. 
And then that may tell you something about whether there's high risk of bias. But I think this is more objective. It's easier to do than thinking about whether something is biased or not. Or not. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I think the risk of bias tool is really interesting. And the grade system where you kind of mull it all down from the risk of bias coding into grade is really cool. So it's worth exploring. Um, coding the nature of the control condition. What did they get in the control group? How different are they from what the treatment group got? Um, whether there are multiple intervention or control groups in a study. Um, how much attrition was there? Do you have any information about people who crossed over from one group to another? Um, how many dropouts did you have? Um, another way to do this, or in addition, if you have pretests, why not compute a pretest effect size? that'll tell you how similar the groups were at the beginning of the study. You're going to compute a post-test effect size. So the pre-test effect size can be a covariant. You can subtract it from your post-test to control to some extent for initial differences. So, um, and those are easy to get in education, social sciences work. They often report pre-tests. Um, contamination, blinding, if it's appropriate. You can code whether it's there. Um, other aspects of methods that you might code depends on the area. Um, so a lot of procedural stuff. Did they monitor the teachers who were delivering the intervention? Um, did they code fidelity of the intervention? Um, what are the training or credentials of the data collectors? I mean, you can think about lots of objective things about how the study was conducted that you might be able to record. And thinking about um, going back to the literature and what they say is important helps here because there's lots of variation. Um, there's some statistical things. You know, did the authors do statistical controls in their analyses? How did they handle missing data? Um, so this is a sample coding item for unit of assignment. And um, so we have individual group or program area to capture whether it's this individual assignment study, group assignment, or these big program areas, or cannot tell because you'd be surprised. Sometimes you're not going to know. Um, and then once we do that, then we code the method of assignment. And this goes on for like a whole other page here about, you know, is it a random design and what does that look like? Uh, so we have random after they matched or stratified. We have random without matching. We have regression discontinuity designs. So we go into a lot of detail about this. So, I mean, I'm talking a lot about all these method quality things, and I think um, what to do about it is up to you. And the point is you want to select a method and then stick with it and do it. Um, you want to examine the influence of those methodological characteristics or the risk of bias on the effect sizes. You can't just code method quality and then not do anything with it. The important thing about coding this is to think about whether that makes a difference in your results and how you talk about the quality of the evidence that you end up with at the end of your systematic review. That's the important part. And that's where this grade thing comes in that's really nice. It helps you summarize the quality of the evidence. And um, so again, it's important to use this information. So whatever you do, do it consistently and then use it. Think about it when you're making your conclusions. Okay, interventions. So this, there's a thousand ways to do this and I don't know what the best way is really. Um, it depends on the literature. I think in all the fields that we work in, in the Campbell collaboration, in, in crime and justice, and education, and social welfare, and in international development, interventions are complex things. 
it's not just CBT. Well, it, it's not just a pill. You know, I didn't give you this pill and give this group a placebo. I gave you this thing that's very nebulous and complicated. And, um, and so thinking about how to code that is important and difficult to do. And um, sometimes you might just say, we're, we're doing a, a review of multi-systemic therapy programs. And so you have to come up, and so maybe there's no intervention coding here as long as you have all the same program. But there might be variations on those multi-systemic therapy programs that you're interested in. So sometimes when, you're, when you have multiple different types of interventions, you might categorize them into mutually exclusive categories. So this is a group family therapy thing, and this is an individual family therapy thing, and this is something else. So you might have these mutually exclusive pots of interventions. Or your interventions might all be of the same general family, but they have different components. So you might code the presence or absence of uh, modeling, or the presence or absence of breakout sessions where they do individual things after the group thing. Um, or they may add little extra pieces of, I don't know what, but you can imagine there's lots of different variations here. So sometimes we'll have a general class and then we'll code a series of yes, no kinds of things. Do they have this? Do they have this? Do they have this? You can also think about any treatment that might have been received by the comparison groups. Because really when you think about those effect sizes that you're going to code, the effect sizes are not the effect of the treatment. The effect sizes are the effect of the treatment compared to the control group. And so it helps to know what the control group has to think about what the magnitude of those effect sizes means. Um, when you're coding the interventions, you might code implementation information, um, the integrity of the, the implementation, dosage, amount, length, frequency. There's lots of different ways to think about dosage. How much, how often, um, how many people are in the group, those kind of things. And the idea here is if you're looking for reasons that different studies have different results, what's going to differentiate those groups in a way that you might be able to examine whether this thing makes a difference. I mean, it may be that the treatment duration doesn't make a difference, but you want to code it so that you can test that. And again, using the literature to tell you about what's likely to be important is, is good, especially with the interventions. So this is um, this very, we were, working on high school dropout programs. And the way we thought about this particular review was not that we were interested in a particular kind of program. We were interested in anything that might influence dropout. And because this was a, a big sort of policy question, it's like, okay, what do you recommend to a school district to influence dropout, and they may have different avenues of action. And, um, and so we grabbed all the studies that had an intervention of any kind that measured the outcome we were interested in. But then it turned into this big thing like, oh my gosh, there's a million ways to think about how to influence dropout. And so we have this whole series of checkboxes about did it include this or not. And in analytically, um, we haven't figured out a very good way to deal with this. But w interventions that have more components were compared with those that had less. Or interventions that were focused on academic things, we could compare those to interventions that were focused on work-related skills. And so you can kind of make little classes of programs. So there are lots of different variations here, but this is just a, you know, if you're interested in sort of big questions like that, you can do something like that. But then we also have down here, what is the focal thing? 
is this a program about school reform or class reorganization or is this a program about services for teen mothers you know so we did put them into categories I mean there were very broad categories but it um, so you kind of sort of have to get your coding of the interventions to fit what your studies look like okay participants this is comparatively easy, um, I think. <laughs> um, you, keep in mind when you're doing this that the data are at the aggregate level. You're not coding the characteristics of an individual subject. You're coding the whole sample. And so you're going to be thinking about things like what is the average age or age range or the proportion of males in the study or the proportion of minorities, those kinds of, of coding things. Um, you might code things about how restrictive the samples were, because st the same program may work differently with a special education setting or special education kids than it might with general education kids, for example. And your outcomes. I wonder how many slides I have left. I can't remember. Um, this, I think, comes up a little bit when you're talking about effect sizes in the effect size workshop. But each effect size, you know, the difference between your treatment and control group at the end of the study, is attached to an outcome. And you need to know what those outcomes look like, not just that it's aggressive behavior. But how was it operationalized? How was it measured? Because you can imagine that teacher reported aggressive behavior in the classroom might look different than self-reported behavior by teenagers. And so effect sizes from these kinds of outcomes may look a little different than these kinds, even if the study is the same on every other characteristic. Um, so informant is a big one. Um, are these composites or are they single indicators? Is it arrest or not arrest? Or is it some, you know, how many crimes and of what type? That may make a difference in the treatment effects. Um, the scale of those outcomes, reliability and validity, timing, all these things may be important to record about your outcomes. Okay, so now you've done all this coding and you're getting to the analysis stage. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about data structure and, and thinking about how to conceptualize these things. Because it, it gets complicated very quickly. And the way I want you to think about this is, think about it like you're doing hierarchical linear, linear modeling, like you have an HLM study. So you have effect sizes, and they're nested within studies, and so you have different levels. You might have multiple outcomes within those studies. You might have multiple time points within a study. Uh, there may be subsamples. There's lots of different levels here that you can design into your coding if you want to. Um, and then the biggest thing is oftentimes if you're doing a systematic review and you're interested in more than one type of outcome, you're going to have multiple effect sizes per study. And so structuring your data and your coding to capture that is, is important. And basically the way I think about it is in the old fashioned kind of coding, you might have one sheet for each effect size. And so you would have to code the design and the participants and the intervention and then that effect size. And then you'd have to do it all over again for the next effect size from that same study. But really you only need to code that study stuff once and then have effect sizes underneath this. This may be old hat to everybody by now. And um, so, we kind of do these things in separate files and then merge them together for analysis. And uh, so all the study coding stuff that I've been talking about for the most part up to now happens in that upper level box there with your study ID. And um, so we have a row 
for each study that tells you it's publication year, all of the sample characteristics, all the intervention characteristics, all that stuff. But that study maybe has three outcomes. Outcome number two, outcome number five, and outcome number 11. And you can see how I've got this structured. It may be that there's construct number two there, and then there's two construct number threes. So that may be the post-test and then the six-month follow-up. And, oh, actually, no, forgive me. That, that's not the follow-up. That may be a parent report and a teacher report of the same behavior. And then your effect size file may have five effect sizes that are attached to different variables over in your outcome level file. There's DB number two, and there's two effect sizes. And their timing may be different. So you might have the first follow-up and then six months later, for example. So thinking about how you put all these things together is, is wise at the beginning because it'll get harder to do later. And usually if you're doing this all in kind of a, a, a like CMA or RevMan, it's built into the system. It sort of knows what you're doing. So procedural details. Um, double coding is really, really, really good. Um, if you have a really large study, it's hard to do and it's expensive to do. Um, but it really is going to get you the best coding, which is the most important part, really. Um, so it's worth doing. If you have a tight budget, then you have to do things like sampling studies and um, double checking six months later to see if people are still reliable. So you, you really have to think about how to think about reliability of your coding if you're not doing double coding on every study. Um, you can record the agreement on all these decisions in your systematic review. Um, I also think you will find that you need to pilot test and refine that coding. There's going to be things that you wrote when you started that once you start reading these studies in really careful detail that you're going to want to change or add, oh, well, this keeps coming up. I'm going to add a new level. So um, making changes to your coding manual while you're coding is, is perfectly appropriate. And you would just justify why you did it. And then make sure you go back and look at all the previously coded stuff. I think it's more... Um, I think it's a better idea to do that than to try to force studies into something that wasn't working. Um, so now we're kind of back to the writing up the document. You're going to do this at the beginning. You're going to organize it hierarchically. You might have a section for the study level stuff or group level, dependent variables, effect sizes. Sometimes if you have a literature that um, has a lot of variability in how both the treatment and control groups are configured, you might code their characteristics separately. So you might have an extra level there. If you're doing a Campbell systematic review, put that protocol, your coding manual, in your protocol. That really helps the peer reviewers see what you're doing and see how you're thinking about it. And then you translate this coding manual into what you're going to really code into. Because, I mean, our paper coding manuals are 20 or 30 or 40 pages of stuff. And really, in the end, you just need tech bo check boxes. Um, this is what one of ours looks like. This is all of our treatment dosage and implementation coding. And um, it's got drop-down menus. If anybody's a FileMaker user, we're happy to share these things with you. Um, here's um, an effect size coding screen. So we have it all, much like RevMan or CMA or the other packages, we have it all pre-programmed, so it'll do the math for you. Um, and that's actually one thing we found with, with double coding. Um, it's coding effect sizes is comparatively easy, I think. There's less of a judgment call. 
Um, so sometimes we might do the effect sizes and then double code all the intervention characteristics because that's where it's hard to get reliable. Um, and then do random samples of effect size coding to make sure it's, it's correct. Okay, common mistakes. Too many coding items. Do not do the kitchen sink method. You're never going to be able to analyze them all in your moderator analysis, and you're just going to be frustrated because you're going to have all these cool things that you want to look at. So, you know, stop yourself and really be thoughtful at the beginning about what you think the important moderators and important things about describing the literature are and code those. Subjective coding items are really difficult. You know, asking coders or asking yourself to evaluate whether this is a good thing or a bad thing is very difficult to do. So the more objective you can be and the more, you know, factual this is, I'm coding a thing that I can read, um, will save you a lot of grief. Um, it's very common to see people coding two reports from the same study as two different studies. Coder drift. Um, coding and doing systematic reviews is really, really, really boring. It's just excruciatingly boring. It's super fun and I love it, but it's boring and it's easy to start drifting off and sort of changing how you think about implementation fidelity. And a lot of times you do that because you've read all these different studies and it sort of is coloring how you think about it. So, so coming back to the original thinking, this is why you do double coding, is to make sure that you know, if you're drifting, you're going to be drifting hopefully in different directions so then you're going to notice it. And um, we have when we're doing active coding, we meet every week or even more often and talk about these coding items and review them and review them and review them to make sure that we all kind of stay on the same page about what we're thinking about when we're thinking about this kind of intervention. And failure to ask questions. If you have people who are coding for you or with you and they never come and ask you a question, they're doing it wrong. It's just, they, you know, it's, you cannot do this without talking to other people about it. And, um, and so really, if no one's talking, there's a problem. Okay. I'm, well, I don't, didn't leave enough time, did I? Um, so the purposes of coding, remember this. Think about this when you're designing your coding instruments. The purpose is to describe the literature that you're reviewing. And so what's most important to know about that literature? It's also important to think of, be able to say at the end of this what the gaps are, what's not covered, what's not reported. One of the most common unreported things in education and social sciences work, at least in American studies, is ethnicity. It is missing half of the time. And, um, and that's important to say in your systematic review because maybe we're going to start changing practice, changing what people report in their primary <coughs> studies. And the third thing is, is you were coding to explain variation or hopefully to explain variation. So think that helps you, helps me think about how to design my coding. Thank you, everybody. And um, now we can have questions. See, I've told you everything you need to know. <laughs> yes. This one? Yeah. And I do have another question. Okay. Uh, I have not done systematic reviews yet. I'm new in the field. Uh huh. Ah, well, so, yeah, um, RevMan is free. It's the Cochrane Collaboration Systematic Reviewing thing. I don't know what to call it. 
the Rev Man, R E V M A N. And it is, um, it's a really nice package. It will do a lot of what you would want to do in a systematic review. It'll help you kind of manage the references and it will allow you to do the eligibility screening. It won't look quite like, I don't know if you can get the abstracts in there because um, I haven't used it. Like we had the abstracts so you can do that little abstract screening. But um, it'll let you design your coding and data extraction and you can do your effect sizes in there. So that's one. Um, one of the um, commercial programs that's really good is called CMA, Comprehensive Meta-Analysis. And that will have the kind of study coding elements and the effect size elements. I don't think it does the literature part of it because you know you got to think about you're managing this bibliographic monster at the same time that you're coding and doing effect sizes so that it may be a separate thing um, the database software that we use is called FileMaker and then we design all of our own databases and that's a commercial package and then we make our own modules I guess you would call them so and and people who use FileMaker are, this is really easy to set up. Um, you can do the same thing if you're an access user, so you can design your own schemes. But that's really, that's, it, I would recommend if you're new to it, to start with one of these kind of reviewing programs. Oh, the, um, the Epicenter in London, I think it's EPPI, yeah, and they have a Epi reviewer. Um, that's also very nice and makes nice plots and outcome stuff and it'll do the coding for you. Does anybody else know other kind of coding packages? Has anybody used other things? For the future I should have a list. Those are probably, yeah? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, Distiller SR for systematic review. Yeah, I've heard it, um, good things about that one. Anybody else? Yes? I have a question about um, the nature of the control groups. Mm -hmm. So in the social sciences, there's, you know, there might be like a multiple control groups. So like ah. a wait list versus an alternative treatment. So is there like a rule of thumb in terms of which one you would compare? And since we're looking uh. for variability, wouldn't it be, I guess, more homogeneous if we just chose someone who got nothing versus someone who got an alternative treatment? Right. That's a really good question. So she's asking about um, the nature of the, the control group in your studies and when you have more than one. So say there's one treatment group and two comparison groups. Mm -hmm. And so you have two comparisons. Um, there's a couple of different ways to handle it and think about it. Um, one way would be to always maximize the contrast between the groups because if that doesn't show you treatment effects, then the ones that are more similar to each other are unlikely to. Um, another way to think about it is if you're going to pick one it would be to pick the comparison group that's most similar to all the other studies that you're coding so that you have some homogeneity there at least in the comparisons because then that gives you more chance to look at variability in your treatments which is what you want to do. Um, there are some techniques now for um, using both you have statistical dependency issues when you do that, so you have to think about that when you get to the analysis stage. And then really you are analyzing it like an HLM. And, um, and so you can do that, especially if that is really common in your literature. So you might have most of your studies have this kind of multiple group thing, then you might want to do that. If you only have one study out of 20 that's got two, then it might be easier just to pick one. And I know some people might average them, 
I think generally that kind of washes out things, especially if those two groups are different. If you have good reason to think that those two groups are the same, then you could average them and then have the single comparison group. So that's maybe more questions than answers mm -hmm. there. <laughs> there's, there are lots of ways to do this, and, um, and I don't think there's really one good way. Anybody else? Rock and roll. Is it cocktail hour? Thank you, everyone, for... Thank you.